Sup, Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, you go to any shitty supplement shop these days and you're bound to find at least several products containing what is known as L-carnitine. Another similar supplement is the derivative of L-carnitine called Acetyl L-carnitine. These are supplements commonly used by athletes for performance enhancement. Specifically, they are supposed to help with strength gains. Although, like with most supplements these days, the data that L-carnitine actually works for that purpose is not all that great. Now, I don't give a shit about any of that, of course, because my, the name of the channel is Hair Cafe, not Gym Self Cafe. So let's not worry about some dubious claims that L-carnitine manufacturers make about its ergogenic benefits. The question here is whether or not L-carnitine has any use in the good fight against the slaphead curse of androgenic alopecia. But first, even though most people have already heard of L-carnitine, what exactly is it? Well, you can see here, L-carnitine is a relatively small molecule. It is not an amino acid or a protein, but it is synthesized from amino acids and is present in foods. Particularly, it is present in meats and dairies, but vegetarians and vegans are perfectly capable of synthesizing carnitine from protein sources, so it is not considered an essential nutrient, meaning you don't have to eat it or supplement it in order to have it in your body. Also, many plants such as cereals, legumes, and tempeh contain carnitine, so there's very little reason why anyone would have to supplement carnitine for any nu nutritional purpose. Carnitine, though, it is still an important substance nevertheless, as it is involved in the metabolism of fatty acids in the cell's mitochondria. So... Carnitine helps with energy production because mitochondria in our cells are what create energy in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, out of oxygen molecules. Given how important carnitine is for metabolism in general, it was only a matter of time, of course, before someone asked the question about whether or not it could help with hair loss. So... It turns out that there is some early research that showed that carnitine helped with the healing of wounds and burn injuries, so this led a Dr. Kirsten Feutzik from Hamburg, Germany in 2007 to ask the question as to whether or not carnitine would have any effect on the growth of the hair follicles. After all, hair follicles produce hair at a faster rate than the fastest growing tumors, so they must use up a lot of energy in the process. So maybe, just maybe, carnitine would help with hair growth. So, the result of this research in the question was published in this article here titled, quote, L-carnitine L-tartrate promotes human hair growth in vitro, unquote. This was an in vitro study, meaning it was done on human hair follicles growing in a culture medium. So not as good as an in vivo study in humans, but still better than a mouse study, which puts it above 99% of all hair loss research these days. Anyways, the hair follicles grew over nine days in the presence of L-carnitine, or a derivative of L-carnitine called L-carnitine L-tartrate, also known as just CT. In the first set of experiments, it seemed that CT was more effective than plain L-carnitine, so the rest of the experiments were done with CT alone. Well... The results showed that CT at concentrations varying from 0.5 to 50 micromoles all improved hair growth as seen in this graph right here. In addition to more hair growth, there were less catagen transition hair follicles present with CT, which would indicate that the antigen growth phase of the hair follicles is being prolonged, which lessens hair loss. In addition, TGF-beta-2, which triggers the catagen phase, was decreased with CT, and there was less caspase, which is a protein that causes apoptosis, which is cellular or death that triggers the end of the antigen growth phase and the start of the catagen transition phase, which causes the telogen resting phase that eventually leads to more hair fall. Here's a figure showing the data on TGF-beta-2, and here is the figure showing the drop in caspase. Now, even though it is rare, there is such a thing as a carnitine deficiency, and the investigators noted, quote, Hair loss as a direct and sole result of carnitine deficiency, to the best of our knowledge, has not yet been documented. But this has probably never been systematically investigated, so that a dis discrete hair phenotype-induced carnitine deficiency cannot be excluded either. Unquote. So although this in vitro study implies that carnitine might be beneficial for hair growth, clearly more evidence was needed to show this. Well, it turns out the same group of investigators from Germany were already doing a human study of carnitine for hair loss because in the same year as this in vitro article, namely in 2007, they published this letter which is titled, quote, 
Indications that topical L-carnitine L-tartrate promotes human hair growth in vivo, unquote. Right away, the investigators mentioned their previous article. So to see whether CT penetrates into the scalp, the researchers first tested two preparations of 2% CT, one in a proprietary liposomal suspension and the other in a conventional hair tonic. They tested the absorption in a cow udder and found that the absorption was best when using the liposomal form as seen in this graph here. This graph measures carnitine concentrations in various skin components, and the fourth column is the liposomal preparation. Next, the researchers studied 60 healthy volunteers with mild to moderate androgenic alopecia, and these volunteers applied either a 2% CT solution or a placebo to the scalp twice a day for six months. Phototrichograms were done before and during treatment in order to get objective hair count measurements. As you can see from this figure here, the results were good. On the left is an example of a before and after treatment. On the right, we see three graphs that show that the hair counts increase. Specifically, we saw the number of antigen hairs increase and the number of telogen hairs decrease during treatment. Regarding side effects, the investigators note, quote, only two volunteers in the test group reported mild side effects. One volunteer reported strong itching, an occurrence of reddish popules or a light burning sensation. Two test subjects in the CT 2% treated group reported increased dandruff, unquote. So pretty well tolerated overall. So this study seems pretty encouraging, but there wasn't much more published research on carnitine and hair, and hair loss, at least not until 2019, when another German group published this paper titled, quote, the effect of a food supplement and a hair lotion on the progression of androgenetic alopecia, unquote. So in this study, a nutritional supplement called TRX2 was studied in an oral form and a topical form. Unfortunately, like many supplements on the market these days, the supplement manufacturers take the approach that the more crap they throw into their product, the merrier. So this supplement contains a lot more than just L-carnitine in the form of acetyl L-carnitine. It also contains zinc, niacin, biotin, and branch chain amino acids. However, the article reassures us that acetyl L-carnitine is the major ingredient in both the oral supplement and the topical formulation, and frankly, I think I'm fine with that because it's not like any of the other things help with hair loss. I even did a video on zinc, which I'll link below. Anyways, the oral supplement has 800 milligrams of L-carnitine, and the hair lotion has 2% L-carnitine. So even though this is not a very pure study due to the fact that supplements weren't pure L-carnitine, let's go ahead and see what these study outcomes were anyways. So there were 79 subjects divided into four groups. One group got the oral supplement, one got the hair tonic, one got both, and the last group got no treatment, it was just a control group. So this was not a blinded study because there were no placebos given to the subjects, so each group knew what they were taking. That unfortunately really weakens the study though because it masquerades the placebo effect, which can be very powerful and explains why even bullshit fake treatments like scalp massages can sometimes produce positive results. Since there was no placebo group and the study was not blinded, some of the benefits in the treatment group could very well have been just placebo effects and there's no way to determine how much of a placebo effect was present because the control group did not receive a placebo treatment. I did a video discussing the placebo and nocebo effect which I'll link below and since I brought up scalp massages I'll go ahead and link that video below too in case there are any triggered Bob England fanboys watching this video. Anyways, the study lasted nine months and the results were assessed via phototrichogram and patient self-assessment. There were 60 men and 19 women. So this figure here shows the change in hair loss, but hair loss was assessed by counting hairs lost while the subjects were combing their hair. So it's not a very scientific method because it is pretty hit or miss how many hairs appear in your comb after you brush it. It can be influenced by factors like how vigorously you comb your hair, how many times per day you comb your hair, or even how long your hair is because longer hair is more likely to get wrapped around the bristles of the brush and get pulled out. Anyways, not a great metric for measuring hair counts at all, but as you can see in this figure, the amount of hair loss went down in all three treatment groups, but went up in the control group. Again, since there was no placebo group, it's difficult to assess what the real effect of the supplement was as opposed to the placebo effect. The next figure you can see here is more objective though, because it looks at the effect of treatment on the ratio of antigen to telogen hairs known as the AT ratio. It is better to have more antigen growth phase hairs and fewer telogen resting phase hairs, so an increase in the AT ratio is a good thing. In the treatment groups, the AT ratio increased while it decreased slightly in the no treatment group. Next, there are some example photos showing before and after images in the subjects from four different study groups. So looking at what we got here, 
Here's someone who used the oral supplement alone. Here's someone on the hair tonic alone. Here's someone on both treatments. And here's a subject who received no treatment at all. So maybe these are good results, but there are a few things to keep in mind here, Chooms. First of all, there is a huge conflict of interest in this study, namely that two of the investigators work for the company that makes the TRX supplement and hair tonic. So this doesn't necessarily mean that the outcomes are wrong, but think about what you would do if you were trying to use research to promote a product. If you had to choose a subject to show the results of the product you want to sell, it stands to reason you'd select the absolute best result rather than a typical result, and without proper controls, it is impossible to know if these allegedly good results were due to the treatment or possibly other factors. In other words, this is just not a good study design as it lacks proper controls to rule out bias and other factors that could influence the outcomes of the study. And even with these likely cherry-picked photos, I'm not convinced there is a real big difference before and after here. Photographic assessments can be influenced by many factors. We're talking about things like hairstyling, lighting, and even hygiene. And photographs like this can be manipulated to falsely claim that a product promotes hair growth. We see this in marketing all the time. So if there's anything positive I can say about L-carnitine, it's the fact that this study at least doesn't rule out the remote possibility that it could be helpful as a hair growth supplement. But the study design is flawed, and there is a very obvious bias given the conflict of interest of the authors. So where does that leave us all with L-carnitine? Well, it is part of a long list of theoretical hair growth stimulants that may have some interesting preliminary data, but are grossly understudied. Given the prevalence of L-carnitine as a supplement, I would at least expect to hear some anecdotal evidence by now that it regrows hair, but I haven't heard any of that, and the supplement's been around and been on the market for decades at this point. Also, there's no study comparing L-carnitine to minoxidil or finasteride in androgenic alopecia, so it is impossible to know how good of a treatment it is, or even if it works at all. We also don't know whether using it in combination with the FDA-approved hair loss drugs would show any additional benefit. I don't care about people wanting to try new things, but nobody in their right mind should ever consider using L-carnitine in place of clinically proven treatments like finasteride and minoxidil. The truth is, is that the supplement industry isn't well regulated, and many of these products are overpriced considering it is debatable whether or not they do anything at all. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if there is eventually a greater attempt by the supplement industry, also known as Big Placebo, to market L-carnitine as a hair growth stimulant, but until they can show us some actual quality data, I wouldn't give them the time of day, and I certainly wouldn't give them my money either. So, stick with what you know works, and throw the rest of it into a paint bucket, because your hair doesn't have the time or luxury to fool around with unproven bullshit. Thanks for watching, my fellow hair loss witchers. I'll see you next time. Take care.